Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our colonization of New England unit by talking about the Plymouth Pilgrims and the start of the Plymouth Colony. Now where we last left off, the Pilgrims had arrived in modern-day Massachusetts and they were searching for the appropriate place to start their colony. But before they did that, on November 11th, 1620, the Mayflower Compact was signed. Many Americans are familiar with the Mayflower Compact, but not a lot of people know why it was signed. Fortunately, Edward Winslow, a pilgrim who wrote Mort's Relation, detailed the reasoning. Let's have a look. This day before we came to harbor, observing some not well affected to unity and concord, but gave some appearance of faction, it was thought good there should be an association, an agreement, that we should combine together in one body, and to submit to such government and governors as we should by common consent agree to make and choose, and set our hands to this that follows word for word. The Mayflower Compact was not some lengthy piece of legislation. It was essentially a simple paragraph. Let's have a look at it. Having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience, in witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names, Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the year of the reign of our Sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, 18th and of Scotland, 54th, 1620. So that is essentially the Mayflower Compact. Bradford referred to the reasoning of the compact to, quote, occasioned partly by the discontented and mutinous speeches that some of the strangers amongst them had let fall. So, the whole reason behind the compact, if you'll recall from previous episodes, it wasn't all Puritans aboard the ship. There were merchant adventurers. And the fact that Bradford refers to these mutinous speeches from strangers, that tells me that it was likely the merchants that had gotten a little upset or anxious or whatever, and it was decided then to create this compact to bind them together. John Carver, who we've talked about before, is named the first governor of the colony. On the 13th of November, according to Winslow, the crew worked to repair their ship. And as we talked about last week, the Mayflower came across the ocean quite damaged. They got beat up on the way there. Some on board were becoming impatient and wished to travel inland. But the apparent dangers and lack of preparation stopped them from doing so. On the 15th, Bradford notes that natives were seen for the first time, but they ran off before any contact could be made. The pilgrims opted to follow them, and even though they could not keep their pace, they still followed their tracks. The tracking continued into the next day where they found a set of graves a former homestead, and a quantity of corn. 
they took some of the corn and buried the remainder of it. Winslow also alleges that the remains of a fort built by Europeans was discovered. The group also came upon two native homes which had beans and corn in them. They took both and Bradford noted that they quote intended to give full satisfaction when they should meet any of them as about six months afterwards they did. So six months later they ran into those people. The remainder of November was spent very much like this, trying to look around and find things. And it's important as they come upon those graves to note what had just occurred in New England that really hurt the native population. And if you're wanting to know more about that and you haven't followed the podcast, I suggest you go back to last week's episode, Precursor to Plymouth, to get an understanding of what was going on. Edward Winslow goes on to describe another discovery in Mort's relation. Let's have a look. As we came into the playing ground, we found a place like a grave, but it was much bigger and longer than any we had yet seen. It was also covered with boards. So as we mused what it should be and resolved to dig it up, where we found first a mat and under that a fair bow and there another mat and under that a board about three quarters long finely carved and painted with three tines or brooches on the top like a crown also between the mats we found bowls trays dishes and such like trinkets at length we came to a fair new mat and under that two bundles the one bigger the other less we opened the grater and found in it a great quantity of fine and perfect red powder and in it the bones and skull of a man the skull had fine yellow hair still on it and some of the flesh unconsumed there was bound up with a knife a pack needle and two or three old iron things it was bound in a sailor's canvas cossack and a pair of cloth breeches the red powder was a kind of embalmment and yielded a strong but not offensive smell it was as fine as any flower so an odd discovery indeed by the Plymouth pilgrims as they're continuing their native ventures and Again, you could tell that that was probably the remnants of the plague that had occurred and potentially a chief that had passed away. On December 6th, a handful of men went back in the boat to check the surrounding area. But the weather was so cold that, quote, the spray of the sea froze to their coats like glass. As they got to the end of the bay that evening, they noticed 10 to 12 natives doing something on shore. They were unable to come to the natives' location until the next day. When they did, they found they had been cutting up a large fish. They spent that day, December 7th, looking for natives, but none were found. That night, a cry was heard in the wilderness, and the guard, that's the Plymouth guard, yelled arm arm the group fired into the darkness and the sound went away they later would believe that it was a pack of wolves so this group you know again they're in unchartered territory they're scared they're not sure what's going to happen and so they they got a scare that evening a couple of days later they encountered natives and were fired upon with their arrows so now the natives actually fire on these men. The men had four muskets to defend their position in the firefight. Let's look at what William Bradford wrote. The cry of the Indians was dreadful, especially when they saw the men run out of the rendezvous towards the shallop to recover their guns. The Indians wheeling about them, but some of the men soon got their guns and let fly among them which quickly stopped their violence. 
so the firing of the weapons held the natives at bay. The pilgrims actually named this place the First Encounter. And it is on, if you look at Massachusetts and Cape Cod Bay, it's on the outer part of Massachusetts, the tail. The group ends up crossing Cape Cod Bay, where a storm created great difficulty. But they managed to find or find their way into a good harbor. They liked the area for its cornfields, fresh water, and safe harbor. On December 18th, the group came across another abandoned encampment. Amongst the plants discovered were herbs, strawberry leaves, sorrel, leeks, onions, flax, and hemp. Also, the trees were comprised of pine, walnut, beech, ash, and birch. So the group decides to settle here. And on December 25th, Christmas Day, 1620, the first house of the Plymouth Colony began construction. And it's interesting to note here that when the pilgrims found Massachusetts, they didn't just quickly stop and settle. It took six weeks from the compact to the start of the first building construction of the colony. The journey around Cape Cod is not without loss. During this time, William Bradford's wife falls overboard and drowns. Some historians speculate her death was a suicide, but little of it is mentioned in the writings. The area was also vastly different from the scene Verrazano described when he explored it nearly a century earlier. And we've done an episode on that, which you can catch the links in the description below. So now a physical colony and a governing structure must be built. And we'll start there next time on Historical Context.